There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. <clears throat> when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the, his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he was back from, he's back, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry <clears throat> and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property, and prostitutes comes home and you kill the fatted calf for him, my son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. Thank you, Jerry. Good morning. Good morning. We'll say it again. How's that? It is a beautiful morning. When I woke up at my house... You could see across the lake and the sun was shining everything. So I said, well, it's the first day of spring, so I'll wear my little Hawaiian shirt. But then I got driving into town further and further, and the fog got thicker and thicker and thicker. But just remember, the sun is shining above all this. Amen. So let's start with prayer. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for a beautiful day, for a day that we can come and worship you. May your spirit fill this place. May it fill our hearts and our souls, and may we... Be open to the words and the thoughts that we hear today from your, from your word, Father. <clears throat> to know that, that we have a source of eternal truth. That we have hope beyond the grave. That we know that we will have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And may we celebrate that today as we spend time in your word. And we just thank you and praise you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the reason I decided to do God's Not Dead um, for this movie is because there is a new movie that just came out to theaters if you get a chance to see it. It's a, I don't know that it's a sequel, but it's from the p people that produce God's Not Dead, and it's called uh, Do You Believe? And it just came out this past weekend. So if you get a chance to see that, and maybe we can even get together and make arrangements if there's enough of us well to, to go. And please keep sharing your prayers because... She didn't even attend any of the classes or anything because she was so sick when we got over there. So this morning's sermon is called The Other Prodigal Son. A lot of your 
Bibles, you have headers so you understand what each section is breaking up. And remember, those headers are not part of the Bible. They were put in by the people who did this version of the Bible to help you understand that there's a break in Scripture there and what this topic is about. And a lot of them say the prodigal son, but a lot of them now say the lost son because they realize that the emphasis maybe isn't as much on the fact that he went off and went crazy and then came to his senses, or if it was that he was lost and then found. And today I want to talk about the other prodigal son. And the reason I called it other prodigal son was because you could probably determine which passage of Scripture that I was talking about. If I put the other lost son, maybe you wouldn't understand as much which passage of Scripture I was talking about. But a prodigal is someone who spends their resources not necessarily money, recklessly. And that's what the one son did. But what did the other son do? Have you ever thought about that? There's so many principles that you can apply from Jesus' parables. And in the past, we've been talking about getting rid of the eye. And I want to explain that a little further because I don't want any under- misunderstanding. Sometimes we take and we twist scriptures to fit our needs, don't we? Rather than fitting ourselves into scripture and God's plans. So we get into an argument and a quarrel and we just say that, well, maybe just for the sake of it, I will remove myself from the situation. Well, if you remove yourself from the situation, how can God use you? You are a member of the body just like someone else is a member of the body. So if you get into an argument, I don't think God ever means for you just to physically remove yourself. He wants you to have a Christ-centered heart, a Christ-centered attitude so that you can not take yourself out of the situation, but so that you can look through Jesus' eyes, that you can love like Jesus, so that you can have compassion, so that you can have compassion for those that are lost, even if you don't like them. You still have compassion for them because you know that your Savior that saved your souls died for them just as much, that there's nothing that they can do to separate themselves from the love of God if they'll just believe in Jesus Christ. So why would you not want to love them? We talked about relationships and how important relationships are. And I heard that theme all through the conference yesterday. That it was so important that we understand that this is God's love letter to us. That it's His revelation of who He is and how much He loves us. That He loves us so unconditionally that there is nothing that we can do. Thank goodness. Because it's so easy for us to fall in and out of love based on how we're treated. So Scripture means quite the opposite when we're talking about verses that say that you should become less. You should become less in your own mind so that you can focus on God's desires and Christ's desires. And Christ loved others so much that He gave His life for them. So I'll give you an example. Fishing season's coming up soon. At least I'm getting excited about it. So let's say that me and a buddy decided to go on a fishing trip. And just for simplicity's sake, we'll give those buddies names. We'll call them Barry and Alan. Okay? So we should go sometime. But wait a minute. I don't like Barry and Alan. It's Alan and Barry, right? At least that makes sense. A comes before B, right? So since A comes before B and is my idea, I should pick where we go fishing, shouldn't we? Shouldn't I? I shouldn't really worry about what he wants to do, should I? And besides, anybody knows that Alan's a better fisherman than Barry, right? So we get out to the lake and we start to go fishing. And I decide that I want to go fish over in the lily pads because everybody knows that the fish congregate around structure. So we should go fish in the lily pads. But Barry and his naive, you know, fisherman thing says, why don't we fish deep water? I think they'll be biting more in the deep water. And I'm like, no, Barry. Silly Barry, no. No. We should go to the lily pads. So we go to the lily pads. And after about an hour of fishing, we don't even have a bite. So I get to thinking about Scripture because I don't have anything else to do. I'm not catching fish, right? So I think about Scripture and I think, hmm, maybe I had the wrong attitude. Should we go home? Well, definitely not. Maybe I should just be concerned more about Barry's attitude now, especially since we're not catching fish anyway, right? If we were catching fish, I don't think I'd still be worried about him, but we'll see. So we decided to go to the deep water and go fishing. But we didn't catch fish there either. Sorry. But how should I have an attitude? Should it be that I remove myself from the situation? Or should it be that I care more about my brother in the first place? Barry would probably go fishing with me anyway, even if I act that way. 
because he loves me. But how much better would it be if I had the attitude, hey man, you want to go fishing me? Where would you like to go? We did that on the way down. Um, I was like, let's go to Cafe Rio. Kim was like, I don't want to go to Mexican. I'm like, but it's so great. You've never had, have you ever had horchata? Have you, any of you guys had horchata? It's like drinking rice pudding. It's divine. It's so good. So I was like, well, I don't care where we go, but Cafe Rio sounds good to me. And then she said, well, when I eat cilantro, I just go like this. I'm like, oh, I should be thinking more about my sister. So we went to Panda because that was great too. But see, I had just gone to Panda the day before. They have wonderful Chinese. So I was being selfish, and I wanted to go to Cafe Rio because I had Panda the day before. But then I thought about my sister, and we went to Panda, and we had a good time. Why don't we love one another and care about one another's needs as much as we do our own, if not more than our own? Jesus Christ is our example, and we're supposed to be His disciples. And He loved us. He loved others more than He loved His own life. 1 Peter chapter 2, 4 through 10 was one of the passages we looked at before. You don't have it, Kim. <laughs> and it talked about the living stone and a chosen people. So how can we be living stones if we act the way that we shouldn't? We're a stumbling block, aren't we? We do the exact opposite. And if we remove ourselves from the situation because there's conflict, then that might be fine and dandy. We're not a stumbling block necessarily again. But how can we be a living stone? Because we've taken ourselves out of the situation. We're called to be God's hands and feet. We can't be that way unless we can get along with others and we can love others. Matthew 18 talked about what we were supposed to do also. We went over that. And it reaffirmed that you're not supposed to cause people to stumble. And how you cause people not to stumble is to become a servant. We heard that in our songs today. So how can I serve again if I remove myself from the, from the controversy? Scripture means that we have to be Christ-centered with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our body, all of our soul. Which, like I said, Christ gave up His throne in heaven to come down and live an example for us and then to die for us in our place so that we did not have to pay the penalty of sins. He loved us so much that we would not have to go with that. And then we would not only not have to go with that, but all through Scripture you see the promise afterwards, that we have the promise of eternal life. When we had Ultrea last week, Catherine asked me to talk about hope a little bit, and I looked up the definition of hope. And in man's eyes, that's how we get our definition skewed again, because we look from man's point of view. And hope means that I have confidence that something that I want to happen it will probably come to be. But that's not hope in Scripture. We have hope in Jesus Christ that we will have eternal life and that nothing can ever take that from us. That's not probably. It's absolute. It's 100%. There's nothing that will ever happen that will take away from us. So hope is not just hope. It's truth when you look at God's Word. In the example I gave, I should have listened and I should have been concerned about Barry. Whether we'd have caught fish or not, who knows if we would have went with the right attitude. But I should love my brother enough to care what he thinks as much as my own. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't worry about your own needs, anything else. It just means that you love one another sacrificially. Luke 9.23, we went over that and it gave three easy steps. But they're not easy to follow, are they? They're very hard. And it started out the same way with humility first. The first step was to humble or deny yourself. The second step was to take up your cross and to do that daily because it is a daily battle that we face. Just because you think you have it licked that today I'm not going to do this or that and you don't give it to God and let Him be in control of your life, that will be the day that you find out you struggle with it again. It's something that we must do daily. And then we follow Christ. We live by His example We follow Him in His words and deeds. Not our own, but His. Which means that we have a Christ-centered rather than a self-centered heart. It's not easy, but the rewards are eternal. John 3.30 is a verse that I'd like you to try to memorize. It's an easy verse. It's short. It says, He must become greater, I must become less. And the He is Jesus Christ. That's the NIV version. If you look at King James, it says, He must increase, but I must decrease. 
The International Standard Version says he must become more important, but I must become less important. The New Living Translation says he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. And the message says, this is the assigned moment for him to move into the center where I slip off to the sidelines. That's what it means to let go of the I, to become Christ-focused, Christ-centered, rather than I-centered. You remember Job? It's a hard story to get your hands around and grasp in your mind. Because here's a man that seems to just fight a cosmic battle just to prove a point. He, if you read in chapter 1, it says that Job is perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed means that he deliberately abstained evil, but yet God allowed Satan to have his way with him to see if he would deny God or not. And Job stood the test. And we can't relate to the loss that Job had. I I try to fathom some of it, but I, I never get my grasp around it. But what you get from the story is, guess what? God is God. We're not. God is in control. Whether we agree with everything or don't agree with everything or can rationalize it from our mind or not doesn't change who He is. He is God of all, Lord of all. It is His story, not your story. And just thank goodness that we have a part in it. In Job 22, verses 21 through 26, it says this, Submit to God and be at peace with Him. In this way, or then, prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from His mouth and lay up His words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove wickedness far from your tent and assign your nuggets to the dust, your gold of Alphar to the rocks in the ravines, then the Almighty will be your gold, the choicest silver for you. Surely then you will find delight in the Almighty and will lift up your face to God. Starts again like we've been hearing, doesn't it? Submit. You've got to die to yourself if you're ever going to lift up Christ in your life. All of the verses we've read seem to start with that pattern. So maybe you think at some point it'll click, right? You cannot let God be more unless you become less. Exodus 23 says, You shall have no other gods before me. And we think so many times that we're not guilty of that. But yet, how many times in our life do we say, I hear you, Lord. I hear your calling for this. But let me get this accomplished first. Let me do this my way. So who's God in your life when you say that? I don't think it's Him. I think we're putting ourselves as gods above Him. God is in control and He loves you so desperately. He doesn't want to force you to follow Him. He wants you to have free choice. That's why He designed you in His image, that you could have free choice. So it's up to you whether you choose to become less or not. Become less so that He can be more. In Job 22, chapter 22, we were commanded to submit to God. And then He gave us promises again. I find that so great. You see it all throughout Scripture. You don't just see a command, but you see that after you have obeyed His command, if you're obedient, you get these outlandish promises from the God that created stars and everything that we see. Life. He didn't have to think about it. He spoke, and then there was life. Who would have ever thought about making a way for your uh, finger not to, to, to bleed to death when you bleed? Who would have thought that it would clot itself? God, because of His infinite wisdom. He didn't have to go back to the drawing board. When He made everything, it was perfect. And He loved us so much that He created all of everything for our enjoyment. He's in control. He's the one that we're supposed to submit to. And He says here that if you do, not only will you be at, will have peace, but you will be at peace. That says so much more. You will be at peace. No worries, no cares, because you've let Him take all the burdens. You've let Him be in control. You don't have to worry about it then. It's in His hands, and He knows everything. You don't know the outcome. You want to try to protect your children and everything, but you don't know what the outcome is. It may be something that they're going through that God has let happen in their life to teach them something. 
You've done the same thing when you've tried to train them. You said, well, this time I'm going to let them learn from their mistakes because you can see the outcome. But we can't always see through God's eyes. He is eternally wise when we're not. And not only does He make that promise, <clears throat> but He says we have the promise of prosperity. Two promises. If you'll just be submissive and obedient, He gives us two promises in this Scripture. We don't deserve any promises. We deserve death. But instead, He gives us life and He gives us prosperity and peace. The problem is, is that we're stubborn, aren't we? We're hard-headed, thick-headed. We don't want to follow. We want to be in control. We think it's about us. The problem is, is we're focusing on the wrong things. Yes, we want to desire things. But we need to desire spiritual things, heavenly things. Things that will bring Him glory and honor rather than ourselves. That's why he mentions here you, that you think that gold is precious, but there is dust to God. And if you're familiar with the gold of Afar, or if I don't know if I said it right or not, that that's where King Solomon even got his riches. So even the play, region in earth where you can get the finest riches, the best of the best, it's still dust to God. And if that's the kind of riches that you're pursuing, you're chasing after dust. It's literally what you're chasing after. I can't say why God allowed all the things that He did to Job. That's a, a long topic that we can spend a lot of time on. But I can tell you three steps and give you three steps out of this too. One, God is God, not you. Two, you were created because He desired it and you were created for His purpose, His will to bring Him glory and honor. Three, the choice is up to you whether you submit or not. Whether you become less so that He can become more. And if you do, you'll have promises. If you don't, you'll have consequences. Isn't that how life works? So I've got a few containers that I brought for an example to give you today because when you see things too, it makes you remember. So I'm looking for the youngest person in here, and I think it's Matt. Would you help me? Sure. Come on. We've got some containers here. One is what? What is that? Glass. It's a wine glass. What's it full of? Other glass. Glass. It's full of itself. Get it? Okay. So we have a wine glass. We have a drinking glass, right? Yep. Okay. And I forgot something. So the drinking glass is supposed to be filled with dirt. <laughs> so this is dirt. <laughs> We have a coffee mug, and you can't see in it, right? Because it's not transparent like the other. What is it full of? Uh, quarters. Wealth, the things that we chase after in this world. And then what is this? A ranch jar. It is ranch. It's a lighthouse dressing jar. I figured it was Thousand Islands since it came from my house. But anyway, um, it's a salad dressing jar. But look, it's empty and it's clean, right? Okay, Matt here is, he's thirsty and he's dying. He needs water or he will die. I'm going to let you choose. Which one do you want to drink out of? This one. Go, go ahead. Let's see if you die or not. You've got to trust me too. It's clean, right? You looked at it. Okay, there's his choice. Thank you. Thanks. You're good. So there's his choices. Would you guys have made the same choice? You've got a wine glass, something that's supposed to serve wine, serve fine drinks, be elegant, be something that when you have fine dining, but it's full of itself. It has broken glass all in it. I wouldn't want to drink out of that glass. And sometimes that's the way we are because we can't be used of God because we're too full of ourselves. Then you've got a regular drinking glass, just a plain drinking glass, but it's filled full of contaminants, full of dirt and debris, so that it can't be used. And we're like that so much in our lives also, where we have all this filth that we haven't got rid of. And you don't have to get rid of your filth to come to God. You just have to come to Him and then submit yourselves and He'll get rid of the filth. He'll do it for you. As you become less, He will become more in your life. It's, it's not just a saying, it's a promise again. 
And then you've got the coffee mug. You couldn't see in it, but it was chasing after the dreams and desires of this world. Well, the things that we think are important. The things that we think are even good, and they are good in man's eyes, but they're still foolishness in God's eyes. And then we've got a container that was designed for something else, but once it was cleaned, once it was emptied, it was able to be used of God to give him water that he needed. And a Christian is exactly the same way, except the water that we give is life-giving water from our testimony to being like Christ so that when we go out, others see us, they see Christ in us. Then they pursue. We don't save them by any means. But then they start asking questions. We let the door open the door in our behavior so that the Spirit can come in and then make a difference in their life. And the water that they will get is eternal rewards, eternal salvation, not just a sip that will help him feel a little bit better because he's parched. That's what we need to do with our lives. We need to clean ourselves out so that God can use us. The master cannot use a container unless it is emptied of itself, emptied of dirt and contaminants and whatever other things that are your gods before him. Luke 15, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. He's not just addressing the crowd. He was talking to the sinners and tax collectors, but then the Pharisees muttered. You know what muttering is? It's when you come under your breath and say, I don't like him, or whatever it is. You act like you didn't want what you had to say to be heard, but you meant for it to be heard. You meant for it to be taken so that they would understand that it's offensive to you. It was offensive that Jesus was talking to sinners, especially tax collectors, the worst of the sinners. They're the ones that not only sin, but take our money and everything from us and think it's okay. They're the chief sinners. So Jesus talked about three different parables here, trying to get his point across. And he goes into the parable of the lost son or the parable of the prodigal son. What do you think his purpose was here? Was it because the son was lost? Do you think it was who the father was? Do you think it was who the other son was? And all aspects of the story are are correct. But I want to talk about the other son today more than anything. And remember, he just talked about the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the parable of the lost son. So you'd think that the emphasis here for sure was on what was lost is now found. But there's so many things we can get out of God's Word. It's living. That when you read it, you, will, you may read the passage over and over and over again. But then something new jumps out at you because it is a living Word of God. One of the speakers that I heard yesterday said that when he goes over Scripture with his family, he said what we tend to do is we tend to read a Scripture and then try to start dissecting it. He said what he does with his family is he goes over a book of the Bible and he said that, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but 50% roughly of the books of the Bible you can read in a half hour to an hour. So he spends that time with his children, and they read over the passage over and over and over again before they ever start dissecting it. And he said sometimes they'll go into conversations where the kids come out and say, well, what about this or what about that? And then other times they won't. They'll just read the Scripture. But they saturate themselves with the Scripture. Then they start going to see what God is trying to reveal in their lives from it. And he said he tries to set an example with it, just like they love ice cream. That every time after dinner, two hours later, they have ice cream. He didn't have to tell them that ice cream was good. Ice cream is yummy. They just have ice cream. So now they love eating ice cream. And he said that he wants the same thing with Scripture, that they read it over and over and spend that time together so that they love Scripture. Then they're wanting to dissect that Scripture to see what it has to tell them. And in Luke 15, um, Jesus is, is answering that muttering. <clears throat> and the Pharisees were the ones, you've got to remember, that they thought they had it all figured out. They thought they were righteous. They were holy. They were doing everything correct as far as the law. And they missed the Messiah that had come to them. They were blind in their own self-centeredness. That they did not see the truth when it was right there in front of their eyes. They were unwilling to offer 
forgiveness and salvation to others. And that's so sad. And so they didn't receive it either. The, in the parable, it's obvious that the, old, the younger son is lost. We get that. And we see that he comes to his senses and comes back to the father. But like I said, what about the younger son? Let's read and see what we see. And I'll start in verse 11. So Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. Not one. So there's two sons here. The younger one said to his father, Give me the share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So, so far the focus has been on the younger son that we obviously know did wrong. We all can see that as self-centered Christians, can't we? This person is doing this wrong. But we can't see sometimes the glass in our own life or the dirt in our own life or the, the search for the things that are important in this world rather than eternally. But if you read on, it says, meanwhile. So meanwhile, there's another story unfolding. There's a story of the older son also. It says, meanwhile, in verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Now, the older son wasn't just in the field. He was working the field. He was doing the father's work. He was doing everything that was to be expected, just like the Pharisees thought they were. They were following all the letters of the law, but they couldn't see the Messiah in front of their face. They couldn't see that they should forgive one another. So the older son, younger son is doing exactly what he should be doing. He's responsible. He's obedient. And he's doing the Father's work. Then if we read on, it says, When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. The servant said, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Here's where we see through the glass. We see the heart. And remember that God sees the heart. It's all throughout Scripture. He doesn't judge a man by his physical appearance. He doesn't judge a man by the works he does. He judges him by his heart, whether his heart is truly focused on him. And that doesn't mean that you won't suffer. Job suffered. Caleb suffered. But they kept their heart focused on God. God's story, God's plan. Is the older hearts, is the older son's heart self-centered? You, I, I'm asking you. You can decide. He is a good son. He's an obedient son. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But here, when he is confronted with his younger brother and the chance to forgive, he refuses to. Verse twenty-eight says the older brother became angry. And refused to go in. He showed his true colors. So which container was he like? The salad dressing container is one that you would think would have salad dressing in it, wouldn't it? And it's yummy. Lighthouse dressings are yummy. But in this purpose here that we use, it brought something totally different. Because it was emptied. So that I could use it for my purpose. Just like if you're totally emptied, and clean, then God can use you for His purposes. The older brother here fit all the examples pretty well, in my opinion, except for being used of God. 
We don't know the end of the story, so we don't really know what happens. We have to think about that. And I think that's why Jesus left it that way. So what happened next? The Father came to Him. Isn't that so much like our Heavenly Father? There's nothing we can do, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His love and His grace, He came to us. Everything is, exists because God willed it. You live and breathe because God willed it and He has a plan for you. And His plan involves you sharing the gospel message, living a life like Christ, a Christ-centered life. I think the younger brother was a fool, but I think the older brother was much more of a fool. He had responsibilities. An older brother has responsibilities not only to the father, but he has responsibilities to his younger brother also to be an example. And he did it in, in actions and indeed by working and staying, but he didn't do it in his heart because he did not want to forgive his brother. He didn't go to his brother and say, I'm glad you're home. He didn't go to his brother and say, hey, you know you did wrong. He refused to go in because he was throwing a self-centered temper tantrum. He didn't want any part of it. So his father went to him, the rest of verse 28. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, he's letting his father know, let me tell you something. All of these years I have been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a goat. Not even a little compared to the fatted calf. So I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, not his brother, you know how that goes? You ever have when your kids fuss and fight and you say to your wife, your son over there, you know what you're doing when you say that statement. But this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home. I didn't read anything about prostitutes in the previous thing. It says he went off for a while living, so he has to embellish it a little bit. He was with prostitutes. He hasn't talked to him. He doesn't know that. But he tries to make him look worse in an effort to do what? Make ourselves look better, right? Come home, you kill the fattened calf. The older son was ungrateful when he should have been loving, when he should have been not only following his actions but letting his heart follow that also. The younger son was going to... Inherit, the younger son gave up his inheritance, but the older son was going to inherit everything the father had. And that didn't change when the younger son came home. That didn't change his status. He was still safe and secure in his father's arms. He still had all of the blessings that the father was going to pour out upon him. But what did he do? Instead of forgiving his brother, instead of acting like a brother, he was self-centered. He exaggerated his brother's sins. And he didn't want any part of the forgiveness. So much like the Pharisees that Jesus was addressing. The passage ends, With my son, the father said, You are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. That's how much God cares about each and every one of us, including those that we don't find lovable, that we don't find forgivable. God loves them just the same. And He's worried about that lost sheep. We are so great, or so lucky, and we should be so grateful that we have the inheritance of the Father. He's given us His Spirit to confirm that we are His sons and daughters in Christ. And we've got to remember that that's something that we need to share, that we need to tell others about. And we have to be loving. We have to have a Christ-centered heart. We have to be willing to forgive so that others can see Christ in us. We don't know what happened. We don't know if the son turned around and said, Oh, I see what's going on or not. But chances are maybe he didn't. We don't know. But what will you do with that story in your life? How will you apply it to your life? Will you be like the Pharisees or will you be willing to accept Others, will you be willing to forgive them? Jesus Christ came to die for every one so that not one lost son or daughter would not be able to find their way home. And that's the responsibility that we're given. So I challenge you today to be less so that God can be more. Let's bow our heads. 
Father, thank You so much for loving us. Thank You for the examples that we have in Scripture. Thank You for Your words always reigning true and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ to know that we are, not that we might be, but we are sons and daughters of You, that we have been forgiven of our sins, that we have been restored to a right relationship with You because of how much You loved us and what Jesus Christ was willing to do for us. Help us to be not filled with ourselves or with other foolish things, but to fill ourselves with You, Father, that we may love one another, that we may be used for Your purpose, for Your will, not our will, but Thy will be done, so that we may bring glory and honor to You. Bless this day and all those that are not able here to be with us. Give us safe travel. We just pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.